Hello and welcome back to Classic Books with Ostara and Lily here. And tonight we're going to get back to doing the Republic by Plato. We're on book 10. One sec. We're pretty close to finishing. I think we've got 30 pages left. And I haven't figured out which book we're going to do next. But on to, to uh, book 10. Why is that? Because even if he had both made but, excuse me, even if he had made but two, a third would still appear behind them, which both of them would have their idea. And that would be the ideal bed, not the other, two others. Very true, he said. <coughs> excuse me. God knew this, and he desired to be the real maker of a real bed. Not a particular maker of a particular bed. And therefore, he created the bed, which is essentially, and by nature, one only. So we believe. Shall we then speak of him as the natural author or maker of the bed? Yes, he replied, inasmuch as by the natural process of creation, he is the author of this and of all other things. And what shall we say of the carpenter? Is not he also the maker of the bed? Yes, but would you call the painter a create, creator and maker? Certainly not. Yet, if he is not the maker, what is he in relation to the bed? I think he said that we may fairly designate him as the imitator of that which is the others make. Good, I said. Then you call him who is third in the descent from nature an imitator. Certainly, he said. And the tragic poet is an imitator, and therefore, like all other imitators, he is thrice removed from the king and from the truth. That appears to be so. Then about the imitator we are agreed. And what about the painter? I would like to know whether he may be thought to imitate that which originally exists in nature, or only the creations of artists. The latter. As they are, or as they appear, you st have still to determine this. What do you mean? I mean that you may look at a bed from a different points of view. Obliquely or directly, or from any other point of view, and the bed will appear different, but there is no difference in reality, and the same of all things. Yes, he said, the difference is only apparent. Now let me ask you another question. Which is the art of painting designed to be? An imitation of things as they are or as they appear of appearance or of reality of appearance. Then the imitator, I said, is a long way off the truth and can do all things because he lightly touches on a small part of them and that part an image. For example, a painter will paint a cobbler, carpenter or any other artist, though he knows nothing of their arts. And if he is a good artist, he may deceive children with simple persons when he shows them his picture of a carpenter from a distance, and they will fancy that they are looking at a real carpenter, certainly. And whenever anyone informs us that he has found a man who knows all the arts and all things else that anybody knows, and every single thing with a higher degree of accuracy, than any other man who ever tells us this, I think that we can only imagine him to be a simple creature who is likely to have been deceived by some wizard or actor whom he met and whom he thought all known because he himself was unable to analyze the nature of knowledge and ignorance and imitation. Most true. And so, when we hear persons saying that the tragedians and Homer, who is at their head, know all the arts and of all things human virtue as well as vice, and the fine things too, for that the good poets cannot compose well unless he knows his subject, and that he who has not this knowledge can never be a poet. We ought to consider whether here also there may not be a similar illusion. Perhaps they may be, have come across imitators and have deceived by them, been deceived by them. They may not have remembered when they saw their works that these were but imitations thrice removed from the truth and could easily be made without any knowledge of the truth because they are a Appearances only, and not realities. 
or after all, they may be in the right, and poets do really know the things about which they seem to be the, to the many to speak so well. The question, he said, should by all means be considered. Now do you suppose that if a person were able to make the original as well as the branch, he would seriously devote himself to the image-making branch. Would he allow imitation to be the ruling principle of his life, as if he had nothing higher in him? I should say not. The real artist who knew what he was imitating would be interested in realities and not in, imi in imitations, and would desire to leave as memorials of himself works many and fair, and instead of being the author of uh, comiums, he would prefer to be the theme of them. Yes, he said, that would be to him a source of much great honor and profit. Then I said, we must put a question to Homer, not about medicine or any of the arts to which his poems only incidentally refer. We are not going to ask him or any other poet whether he has cured patients like Asclepius or left behind him a school of medicine such as the Asclepiads were, or whether he only talks about medicine and other arts at second hand. But we have a right to know, respecting military tactics, politics, education, which are the chiefest, chiefest and noblest subjects of his poems. And we may fairly ask him about them. Friend Homer, then we, may, we say to him, if you are only in the second room from truth, in what you say of virtue, and not in the third, not an image maker or imitator, and if you are able to discern what pursuits make men better or worse in private or public life, tell us what state was even better governed by your health. The good order of Lacedaemon is due to Lysurgus, and many other cities, great and small, have been similarly benefited by others. But who says, says that you have been a good legislator to them, and have done them any good. Italy and Sicily boast of Chirondus, and there is Solon, who is renowned among us. But what city has anything to say about you? Is there any city which he might name? I think not, said Glaucon. Not even the Homerids themselves pretend that he was a legislator. Well, but is there any war on record which was carried on successfully by him? or aided by his counsels when he was alive, there is not. Or is there any invention of this, his applicable to the arts or human life, such as Thales, the Milesian, or in, in a Carsus, the Scythian, and any other ingenious men have conceived, which is attributed to him? There is absolutely nothing of the kind. But if Homer never did any public service, was he privately a guide or teacher of any? Had he in his lifetime friends or who loved to associate with him and who hand him down to posterity a Homeric way of life such as was established by Pythagoras who was so greatly beloved for his wisdom and whose followers are to this day quite celebrated for the order which was named after him? Nothing of the, the kind is recorded of him. For surely Socrates, Creophilus, the companion of Homer, that child of flesh whose name always makes us laugh, might be more justly ridiculed for stupidity. If, as is said, Homer was greatly neglected by him and others in his own day when he was alive. Yes, I replied, that is the, tr that is the tradition, but can you imagine, Glaucon, that if Homer... Had really been able to educate and improve mankind. If he had possessed knowledge and not been a mere imitator, can you imagine? I say that he would not have had many followers and been honored and loved by them. Protagoras of Abdera and Prodicus of Theos and host of others have only to whisper to their contemporaries. You will never be able to manage either your own house or your own state until you appoint us to be your ministers of education. And this ingenious device of theirs has such an effect in making men love them 
that their companions all but carried them about on their shoulders, and is it conceivable that the contemporaries of Homer or again of Hesiod would have allowed either of them to go about as rhapsodists? If they had really been able to make mankind virtuous, would they not have been as unwilling to part with them as with gold and have compelled them to stay at home with them? Or if the master would not say, then the disciples would have followed him about everywhere until they had got education enough? Yes, Socrates, that I think is quite true. Then must we not infer that all these poetical individuals, beginning with Homer, are not our only imitators. They copy images of virtue and the like, but the truth they never reach. The poet is like a painter, who, as we have already observed, will make a likeness of a cobbler. Though he understands nothing of cobbling, and his picture is good enough, for those who know no more than he does and judge only by colors and figures. Quite so, in like manner. The poet with his words and phrases may be said to lay on the colors of the several arts, himself understanding their nature only enough to imitate them. And other people who are as ignorant as he is and judge only from his words imagine that if he speaks of cobbling or of military tactics or anything else, in meter and harmony and rhythm, he speaks very well. Such is the sweet influence which melody and rhythm by nature have, and I think that you must have observed again, again what a poor appearance the tales of poets make when stripped of the colors which music puts upon them and recited in simple prose. Yes, he said. They are like faces which were never really beautiful, but only blooming. And now the bloom of youth has passed away from them. Exactly. Here's another point. The imitator or maker of the image knows nothing of true existence. He knows appearances only. Am I not right? Then let us have a clear understanding, not be satisfied with half an explanation. Proceed. Of the painter, we say that he will paint reins, and he will paint a bit. Yes. And the, one, and the worker in leather and brass will make them. Certainly. But does the painter know the right form of the bit and reins? Nay, hardly even the workers in brass and leather who make them. Only the horseman who knows how to use them. He knows their right form. Most true. And may we not say the same of all things? What? And there are three arts which are concerned with all things. One which uses, an, another which makes, a third which imitates them. Yes. And the excellence of beauty or truth of every structure, animate or inanimate, and of every action man is relative to the use for which nature of the artist has intended them. True. Then the user of them must have the greatest experience of them, and he must indicate to the maker the good or bad qualities which develop themselves in use. For example, the flute player will tell the flute maker which of his flutes is satisfactory to the performer. He will tell him how he ought to make them, and the other will attend to his instructions, of course. Then, excuse me, the one knows and therefore speaks with authority about the goodness and badness of flutes, while the other, confiding in him, will do what he is told by him. True, the instrument is the same, but about the excellence or badness of it, the maker will only attain to a correct belief, and this he will gain from him, who knows, by talking to him and being compelled to hear what he has to say, whereas the user will have knowledge. True, but will the imitator have either? Will he know from, one, from use whether or no his drawing is correct or beautiful, or will he have right opinion from being compelled to associate with another who knows and gives him instructions? about what he should draw. Neither. Then he will no more have true opinion than he will have knowledge about the goodness or badness of his imitations. I suppose not. The imitative artist will be in a brilliant state of intelligence about his own creations, nay, very much the reverse. And still he will go on imitating without knowing what makes a thing good or bad, and may be expected, therefore, to imitate only that which appears to be good to the ignorant multitude. Just so. Thus far, then, we are pretty well agreed that the imitator has no knowledge without worth mentioning of what he imitates. Imitation is only a kind of play or sport. 
And the tragic poets, whether they write in iambic or in, in heroic verse, imitators in the highest degree. Very true. And now tell me, I conjure you, has no imitation been shown by us to be concerned with that which is thrice removed from the truth? Certainly. And what is the faculty in man to which imitation is addressed? What do you mean? I will explain. The body which is large when seen near appears small when seen at a distance. True. And this same and the same objects appear straight when looked at one of the out of the water and crooked when in the water. And the concave becomes convex owing to the illusion about colors to which the sight is liable. Thus, every sort of confusion is revealed within us, and this is that weakness of the human mind to which the art of conjuring and of deceiving by light, shadow, and other ingenious devices imposes have an effect upon us like magic. True, and the art of measuring and numbering and weighing come to the rescue of the human understanding, where there is the beauty of them and the apparent greater or less or more or heavier. No longer have the mastery over us, but give away before calculation and measure and weight. Most true, and this surely must be the work of the calculating and rational principle in the soul. To be sure, and when the principle measures certifies that some things are equal or that some are greater or less than others, there occurs an apparent contradiction, true. But were we not saying that such a contradiction is impossible? The same faculty cannot have contrary opinions at the same time about the same thing. Very true. Then that part of the soul which has an opinion contrary to measure is not the same with that which has an opinion in accordance with measure. True, and the better part of the soul is likely to be that which trusts to measure and calculation, certainly, and that which is opposed to them is one of the inferior principles of the soul, no doubt. This was a conclusion at which I was seeking to arrive when I said that painting or drawing and imitation in general, when doing their own proper work, are far removed from truth. And the companions and friends and associates of a principle within us which is equally removed from reason, and that they have no true or healthy aim. Exactly. The imitative art is an inferior who makes, who marries an inferior, and has an inferior offspring. Very true. And is this confined to the sight only, or does it extend to the hearing also? Relating, in fact, to what we term poetry, probably the same would be true of poetry. Do not rely, I said, on a probability derived from the analogy of painting, but let us examine further and see whether the faculty with which poetical imitation is concerned is good or bad. By all means, we may state the question thus. Imitation imitates the actions of men, whether voluntary or involuntary, and which are, as they imagine, a good or bad result has ensued. And they rejoice or, so or sorrow accordingly. Is there anything more? No, there is nothing else. But in all this variety of circumstances is the man at unity with himself. Or rather, as in the instance of sight, there were confusion and opposition in his opinions about the same things. So here also are there not strife and inconsistency in his life. Though I need hardly raise the question again, for I remember that all this has been already admitted, and the soul has been acknowledged by us to be full of these and 10,000 similar oppositions occurring at the same moment. And we are we were right, he said. Yes, I said, thus far we were right, but there was an omission which must now be supplied. What was the omission? Were we not saying that a good man who has the misfortune to lose a son or anything else which is most dear to him will bear the loss with more equanimity than other? Another, excuse me. Yes, but we will. But will he have no sorrow, or shall we say that although he cannot help sorrowing, he will moderate his sorrow? The latter, he said, is the truer statement. Tell me, will he be more likely to struggle and hold out against his sorrow when he is seen by his equals or when he is alone? It will make a great difference whether he is seen or not. When he is by himself, he will not mind saying or doing many things which he would be ashamed of anyone hearing or seeing him do. 
True, there is a principle of law and reason in him which bids him resist, as well as feeling, feeling of his misfortune, which is forcing him to indulge in sorrow. True, but when a man is drawn in two opposite directions, to and from the same object, this, as we affirm, necessarily applies two distinct principles in him. Certainly, one of them is ready to follow the guidance of the law. How do you mean? The law would say that to be patient under suffering is best and that we should all not give away to pay impatience, as there is no knowing whether such things are good or evil, and nothing is gained by impatience also, because no human thing is of serious importance, and grief stands in the way of that which at the moment is most required. What is most required, he asked, that we should take counsel about what has happened, and when the dice have been thrown, order our affairs in the way which reason deems best not like children who have had a fall keeping hold of the part struck and wasting time in setting up a howl but always accustoming the soul forthwith to apply a remedy raising up that which is sickly and falling banishing the cry of sorrow by the healing art yes he said that is the true way of meeting the attacks of fortune yes i said and the higher principle is ready to follow this ingestion of reason clearly and I'm going to stop right there we have another oh, another 20 pages to read in the Republic if you enjoyed this video please be sure to hit like subscribe comment below and hit the notification bell and also stay tuned for more of Plato's Republic part 3 book 10 with Lil and Ostara